Tonight we're going to begin the 27th chapter of Genesis, which I have titled, The Result of Esau Despising His Birthright. Now this is a very controversial passage. There's been a lot said about it. There's a lot of prejudice about it. I'm not interested in any of that. I really don't care what anybody said about this passage. If it requires me to take it any other way than just like it's written. Amen. And I'm going to refuse to editorialize what happened if the Holy Spirit didn't. Then I'll tell you why as we proceed along. The result of Esau despising his birthright. This will be our 43rd lesson in Genesis. <coughs> the first 17 verses. It came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, My son, he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold now, I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison, and make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. <coughs> and Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and, I, and make me savory meat that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock and fetch from thence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father that he may eat and that he may bless thee before his death. <coughs> and Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. My father, peradventure, will feel me, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver, and I shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing. And his mother said unto him, <coughs> Upon me be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice and go and fetch them. <coughs> and he went and fetched and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory meat such as his father loved. And Rebekah took goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. And she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. <coughs> now texts like this are very troublesome for a lot of people. because they've never grasped how different it is under Christ. This somehow has escaped their attention. And so whether it's Eve at the foot of the tree or whether it's Rebecca here, they can't distinguish between the lack that exists when you don't, when you're not born again, 
and when you are. So this creates all kind of problems for them. I have heard preachers and read quarterlies. I mean, it's hard for me to say quarterly. It's some of the most damaging books that's ever been written. Quarterlies. If you don't know what they were, those are Sunday school books. Church actually paid to get them. There's very little in them. But there's a culture that's been developed as a result of this kind of teaching, this kind of academic approach to Scripture, that you really have to have a dig pretty deep to get at the meaning of some of these texts. You have to be devoted. You have to have some Bible knowledge, too. You, you, you will never, you'll never strike at it if you don't. If you have a narrow scope of knowledge, just leave texts like this alone. Read them, believe them, and leave them alone. Because you'll not be able to figure it out. <clears throat> now the thing that I want to impress upon you as we begin here is how very little of God was known how very little of God was known at this time comparatively speaking with what did they know about God well, they didn't know anything like eternal heaven world to come zero Nothing had been said about that to anybody on earth. Justification, nothing. Moses wrote and told you Abraham believed God. God imputed it to him for righteousness. God didn't tell that to Abraham. Well, here's the type of things God revealed up to this time. God uh, provides food. God gives dominion. The day Adam gave him dominion. God causes enmity. I will put enmity between thee and the... God causes enmity? I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between the woman and, your, and you. God judges men. Did Adam and Eve? Did Cain? Did it the flood? God curses men. This is God we're talking about. Cursed Abel. And he cursed him in the flood and he cursed him at Shinar. God appoints one person to take the place of another. Early on, Eve recognized this when Seth was born, said, I've gotten a man from the Lord to, to stand in the stead of Abel. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. God did that. God could have protected Abel, but he didn't because he's, he was establishing that to reconcile man has got to be a death. So he, he acquainted. God's spirit doesn't always strive with man. God has to like a point beyond which he will not go. And God assesses men. He assesses them. Men are real tolerant of one another. <laughs> but when God assesses men, he says, Oh, boy, the imagination of the heart is only evil continually. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scrub the earth clean. See, God assesses men. God destroys the ungodly. This is a trait of God. God has grace upon people. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God spares the righteous. He did. No one told Abraham he'd spare the city of Sodom. Just find ten. See, this is God making known. Notice nothing is about anything except on earth to this point. God makes and establishes covenants. Made a covenant with Noah. Made a covenant with Abraham. Covenant with Isaac. Covenant with Jacob. God can cause things to happen that aren't normal. Like the flood. Like all of a sudden, nobody can understand each other. They all spoke different languages. <coughs> God remembers his covenant. If God makes a covenant, he remembers it. He remembered his covenant with Noah. God shows people 
Where did it go? Called him to a land. I'll show you. I'll show you. Offer her eyes. I got a mountain. I'll, I'll show you. God shows people where to go. God revealed he's the, oh, he's the Lord. I'm God Almighty. Reveal that about himself. He revealed he's a shield and a reward. He can protect. And he can embellish the rewards upon people. God gives the people something something that belonged to somebody else. <laughs> God can give somebody something that belonged to somebody else. He gave Abraham the land of Canaan, but it belonged to somebody else at the time. Amen. Gave it to Israel, belonged to somebody else at the time. <coughs> God can do that. He's a mighty God. <coughs> God makes people fruitful. You found it in Abraham. God thought he does things at appointed times. God like operates on a, his own calendar, so to speak. And God restrains the wicked. Now you may find some more things. I think you'll have to search to find them, but that's what they knew about God. Not much about God himself, about his character. You know, there wasn't a whole lot about that. There are divine traits that weren't affirmed during those times. From Adam up to Isaac now. <coughs> the goodness of God. From Genesis 1 through Genesis 27, 17, and with the exception of God's own observation of creation, it was good. The word good is never applied in any way to God. Interesting, isn't it? Graciousness. To this point, the word gracious is not even mentioned. Mm -hmm. From Genesis 1 through our text. Much less revealed. Yeah. <laughs> kindness. God's kindness. The only reference to God's kindness is when Abraham's servant asked the Lord to show kindness to his master. That's it. That's the only reference. God's grace. The only reference Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And it is an editorial remark written several hundred years after it happened. God's long-suffering. There's no reference to his long-suffering from Genesis 1, 12 to, to the 27th chapter. No reference. No reference to God's long-suffering. The love of God, there's not a solitary reference to God's love in this section, Genesis 1, 1 through 27, 17. Not a single one. God's righteousness, there's no reference to his righteousness <coughs> in that passage. There's no reference to forgiveness in that section of Scripture. There's no reference to the mercy of God. There are three references to God's mercy. One is a, an editorial remark made by Moses hundreds of years later concerning the deliverance of Lot. God had mercy upon him. That, what, that wasn't told Lot. That was told to people several hundred years afterward. And Lot's comment to the angel, have mercy on me. That's, all, that's the only reference, the only references. Abraham's servant said God showed him mercy in finding Isaac a wife. That's, that's the only reference to mercy. Now, if this is all you knew, just what I told you, think, how, how would you think if this is all you knew? Quite different than you think now, I can tell you right now. In fact, I, I will challenge you. I, I, don't, I think you will find it very difficult to even imagine how you'd think without this knowledge. It's such a part of you. You couldn't imagine. But they didn't have this. So already I've, I'm loosed in any judgmental <laughs> attitude because I sure wouldn't want to be in that state. They were. In addition... There's hardly anything declared about God's purpose or the God purposing something other than he told, I will destroy the world with the flood and so forth. Very little about God's purpose. So now we're going to be, to, we're going to be exposed to how Rebecca thought in this text. And whatever may be said of this event, it should be clear that 
The thoughts of Rebecca were shaped by a promise God made to her 70 years before the event that's taking place here. Amen. This is 70 years after God said one word one time. How do you think you would have fared remembering it? Hmm. Some people hear a great word of God and they forgot it the next day. We're talking 70 years. Yes. She didn't forget it. It's estimated Jacob was 70 years old at the time of our text. He just wasn't like a little boy. <laughs> 70 years old. And Rebecca was over 100. So we're not talking about children here. Talking mature people. So this event occurs 70 years after God had only one time revealed the elders will serve the younger. Period. That's all he said. He didn't, say, he didn't elaborate on it. <coughs> Something that hadn't taken place under this time. 70 years after Jacob was born, he still didn't have dominion over his brother. His brother wasn't coming to him for anything. Yet that was a promise. The elder shall serve the younger. Seventy years now hasn't happened yet. Now you got to think how you think under these circumstances. Say, well, she should have gone to the Lord about it. Well, it wasn't all that common to do that. <coughs> yet Rebecca had apparently clung to this promise, even though it, was, it looked like it wasn't going to come to pass. Yes? And underscored, this promise was underscored by the kind of person Esau became, too. Oh, yes. I mean, she, Boy, she had not, not noted all this, too. <laughs> now in our text, Isaac determines to bless Esau before he dies. He... he he doesn't know when he's going to die. He, tell, he tells you, so I, I'm, I'm, I don't know when I'm going to die, but I think it's getting kind of close. And I want to I want to be at least in a good frame of mind and feeling good when I bless you. Yeah, that's, that's how he's thinking now. Right. So I'd like to have one of those really good meals that you fix. Very delicious meat. I want to be in a good frame of mind when I deal with something important. Well, don't you too? There's nothing, <laughs> nothing unusual about this. You don't see, I think I, I feel terrible, I'm fatigued, I can't think straight. Now I'm going to make some major decisions at this time. Well, sensible people don't think that way. After Isaac calls for Esau, Rebecca's going to hear what he says and put a plan in motion. All right, that's got an overview. <coughs> Our text is it came to pass when Isaac was old. Isaac was old. Now, according to reasonable estimates, the lowest would be 130, the top end 137. That's his age at this time, somewhere between 130 and 137. At this time, he'd lived about 72% of his life. He died when he was 180, so he lived a, he'd be like equivalent to like a, if a man lived to be 80, about 38-year-old man. Now the same thing, he, the age wasn't, the, how long he lived wasn't what determined he was old, and his eyes were getting dim, that's what, yeah. that's what told it he was getting old. That's what it says, his eyes were dim. He couldn't see, so he's, he's, he's near, blind. I don't know if he was totally blind, but he, he couldn't see, and so he said, I'm on, I'm on the downhill now. Okay. Same thing was said of Eli when he got old. Said his eyes were dim. He couldn't see either. The idea is his eyes are yielding to mortality. See, <laughs> yours are going to, your body yields to mortality, and death swallows life up. And at the resurrection, life will swallow death up. <laughs> now, the fact of death is, of course, declared throughout Scripture. 
The word died is mentioned over 200 times. That word died mentioned over 200 times in Scripture. The word death is 370 times. Since sin entered into the world, death is a reality men learn to reckon with. Amen. We're living in an entertainment-crazed society that never really thinks about death. Because yeah. that's an effect that entertainment and distraction has on you. It takes your mind away from reality. But these people, they thought about it. About death. <clears throat> Only two men in the history of all humanity escaped death. One was Enoch. He was translated up into, just straight up into heaven from earth. And Elijah, a fiery chariot, came down from heaven and picked him up and took him back up there. Aside from those two men, everybody's died. So those who emphasize having good health and even representing God is guaranteeing this to his people. See, this is, they got the fact. At some point, you got to face the fact. It's a point that a man wants to die. Our dominating quest should be that at the resurrection, we get an advantage by being raised from the dead. That's our aim. I might attain, Paul said, unto the resurrection of the dead. So when you come out and you're Come out of the grave, you're in your new body. It's not going to be the damnation because there's going to be a resurrection unto damnation. So people are going to come out of the grave and go into hell. <laughs> yeah. Some people deny this, call themselves Christians, deny this. Others don't want to hear. See, you got to hear about it. Got to know about it. <laughs> Here's Isaac. He knows death. He knows the reality of it. So he calls for Esau, his eldest son. <coughs> doesn't call for Jacob, doesn't call for Rachel, calls for Esau, his eldest son. Said unto him, my son, and he said, hear my. <coughs> now that Isaac's noticeably deteriorating, he begins to think about preparing for the continuance of his, of his inheritance, of his domain. And so he calls for Esau, which he loved. He, he preferred Esau. Seventy years had passed since Jacob and Esau were born. A little prior to those births, <coughs> God revealed that the elder would serve the younger. I don't know if Rachel ever told Isaac that or not. Uh, Rebecca ever told Isaac that or not. Record doesn't say that she did. Start, you'd think what she would, but it still didn't say. Doesn't say she did. In the intervening years, forty-five years had passed since Esau sold his birthright. See, it's important to think of these things because, like, what exactly do you recall forty-five years ago? Well, I recall some things, but like I couldn't write a book on it, I could tell you. So he calls for Esau. It's a 70-year-old man. Esau is a 70-year-old man. Isaac says 130, we'll say 137-year-old man. He calls for Isaac. Isaac's not a teenager now, 70-year-old man, Esau, and he says, Behold, here am I. Well, see, this would be kind of unusual. Kind of unusual in our country, wouldn't it? Have a 45 or 50-year-old man, his father called him, he said, here I am. Esau says, here am I. I'm here. He responds immediately. He's instantly available to his father. And his father tells him, I'm old now. I don't know the day of my death. Well, I imagine Esau probably knew his dad was old, his father was old, but I'm old now. Beth is at hand. <clears throat> he didn't, he wasn't filled with fear. 
He's going to set things in order before he leaves. He's going to set things in order before he leaves. Amen. Now, scriptures tell us the doctrine that it's appointed that a man, the man wants to die, and if men are God conscious, they live with an awareness of, yeah. of this. Hebrews captures the attitude of these people, of which Jacob and Isaac and Jacob were two. He spoke of their pilgrimage. They were pilgrims and strangers in the earth. And their exposure to this present evil world, they said, this is the reason, this isn't where it's at. This is how they reason. They look for a better country. Yeah, I got a better, better country. They look for a city that had foundations. The best city probably struck out building program was at the plain of Shinar, and that didn't work out too well. <coughs> it appears to me that in the normal experience of life, there comes a time when you're especially sensitive of your mortality. Well, I know this is the case because I'm, I'm in a time. <laughs> I'm in a time like that. When you're especially are aware that you're mortal. All right, now a person who doesn't know God and who is carnal will lament. Life's so short I didn't get done. I wanted to get done. And he'll lament. But the person who lives by faith will say, now I want to kind of clean up the house before I leave. Yeah. Set things in order. In fact, that was a word given to him. Set your house in order. Uh -huh. yeah. Get ready to leave. So when you, our brothers and sisters, you're going to die. You're going to die. Yeah, that's right. So don't leave a mess behind when you do. Yeah. Don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Resolve not to do it. Yeah. Set your house in order. Mm -hmm. When do you do it? When you particularly are aware. Mm -hmm. I'm declining. I can tell it. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 <clears throat> reads, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through all their, who th through, th through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Right now, without Christ, death scares people. And it brings fear to people. They'll do anything not to think about it. Go someplace. Go party. Do something so you don't think about it. All our lifetime we're subject to bondage because of the fear of death. But see, whatever you may think about Isaac, he didn't have this fear of death. He's making preparations for die for dying. What I want you to do, son, he said, is to bring me some venison, some of that really, really good meat that you get. Wild meat, I love the taste of it. I want it to be in a good frame of mind, my mind working good, nothing distracting me, so I can bless you. Now these saints, they knew about mortality, but they did that's about it. They didn't know much about beyond the grave. Some of these saints of old made some statements about death that showed you that some of the more strong ones kind of sensed there's something beyond, but they weren't too sure what it was. <coughs> Job, who was probably a contemporary of Isaac, here's what he said. There's hope of a tree... If it be cut down, it will sprout again. That the tender branch thereof will not cease, though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stock thereof die in the ground. Yet through the scent of water will bud and bring forth boughs like a branch. But, 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 man dieth and wasteth away, yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? He didn't have, he didn't have any information on this. Where is he? You want to hear? Just read the book of Ecclesiastes. It'll be, Solomon just comes over this a lot. 
Is not work nor knowledge or device in the grave whither thou goest? David thought the same way, except when he was prophesying. They didn't. There just wasn't a lot made known <coughs> about this. Now think how. Here's another statement from Job: If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. Thou shalt have a desire to the work of thy hands. It's his faith talking, see, but he, did, he didn't really know very much about it, but he, he knew enough to wait patiently, but he, see, I'm trying to show you that Isaac did more in preparation for his death than some people that got a lot more knowledge do. Prepared for it adequately. Now, the contrast between Isaac <coughs> <laughs> these patriarchs and us is not found in their character. <coughs> Some of them are superior to professed Christians today. And they, they'll tell you they were. But it was in the amount of revelation they'd received. They didn't know what you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now why do I say these things? <coughs> so we can better understand Isaac and yeah. We can kind of work through our way through this passage with some understanding. Those with lesser revelation have lesser insight, and they think differently than people with greater revelation. Not so much they come to wrong conclusions, they can't think as far. They can't go as far with their reasoning as someone that has revelation. Now think how Paul... Paul's approach in his death, he, he was aged, but his experiences had aged him more than the normality of life. And here's how, here's how he spoke when he got ready, getting ready to die. I'm, I'm now ready to be offered, not buried. I'm ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I've kept finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give to me, not to me only, but to all them also that love is appearing. See how different? Mm -hmm. yeah. It was because he knew more. Yeah. You'll find as you grow in Christ and you know more, you, talk, you begin to talk. You talk different about key matters. Here's another statement he made. He's going to... Isaac called for a special meal. Now remember, Isaac called for a special meal. All right, now here's what, here's what Paul called for. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Christians to Gal Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only looks with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he's profitable, profitable to me for dying, for the ministry. Yeah. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> This is how an illuminated person talks. See, thinking has its limitations, brethren, no matter who you are. Your thinking can't extend beyond what's been revealed and comprehended. You can't. Some people try. They, they try and think beyond what they know and beyond what they've experienced, and they come to all kinds of erroneous conclusions. So... Isaac doesn't do that. He just calls for a meal. So at least he could be in a proper frame of mind that I, my soul may bless thee before I die. Now, he's not talking about just a general blessing. Rebecca knew this. He's talking about the confirmant of the airship because it's God had promised through you, through you and your seed, so he's... He's going to bestow that blessing. He intends to bestow that blessing <coughs> upon Esau. Now, considering, uh, considering the following factors, the revelation of God concerning the preeminence of Jacob was given 70 years before this. There's no record of Rebekah passing that information on to Isaac. Esau sold his birthright 45 years before this, and there's no record that Isaac knew that Esau did this. So, see, that at least changes the way I, right. the way I look at this passage. Yeah. 
The only faith can function ideally under less than ideal circumstances. Uh It's the way it is. Father, am I still going to get the uh, the blessing of the firstborn? That's right. Remember, I sold my birthright. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he forgot it too. (laughs) Well, he despised it. He despised his birthright. Well, the scripture says Rebecca heard when Isaac spake unto Esau. <coughs> I was not clear from the text whether she was like overheard it from around the corner or something like that or was in the room. Some of the texts, some versions represent that she was actually there. The message Bible says she was eavesdropping. She learned this. But I prefer to think she was conspicu- conspicuously present in the room. Yeah. He was not aware, and that Isaac was not aware that he was contradicting any word mm-hmm. that God has spoken. That's right. Even though he was, but he wasn't at this time, for whatever reason, he wasn't aware of it at this time. We know from Isaac that when he knew what God said, he was thinking about it, he always did the right thing, but right. he wasn't aware of it. Why he wasn't, I, I don't know. My own view of the matter is that this was arranged by the providence of God. This is how God chose to work out Amen. his plan. Now, all right, now I'm gonna, I want to reason a little bit about this. Let's take Joseph as a beginning example. How God worked his will for Joseph to be over Egypt and dispense grain and save a life of people. Let's see how God worked that out. He worked that out through the hatred of Joseph's brothers, their plot to kill him, their sale of him as a slave, false accusations against him by Potiphar's wife, and his unjust imprisonment. Yet when holy men of God summarized it, it said God sent him. And he worked through these otherwise unjust circumstances. That's a bona fide example of God working this way. Let's take another. Let's take Israel. Israel goes down into Egypt. Nation, Israel goes down into Egypt and suffers unjustly for 400 years. It was wrong what the Egyptians did to them. Yet they were exempted from the plagues while they were there. They suffered at the hand of the Pharaoh and his and the Egyptians, but they were miraculously they walked out after all that four hundred years. We're talking four hundred years, four centuries. We're talking, but this was God working this out. Yeah, this is how He worked it out. His inscrutable wisdom. <coughs> and then He goes back and and He tells Moses, "I want you to tell Pharaoh." why he's even Pharaoh. Here's what he said. In very deed for this cause have I raised thee up for to show in thee my power that my name may be declared through all the earth. So this whole thing of Pharaoh and the oppression, this was, God was doing this. Paul takes up the case. He builds quite a case. Romans 9, 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Mm -hmm. even for this the scripture saith, see there wasn't any scripture at the time, but the scripture saith to Pharaoh, for this purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Now Paul draws the conclusion. Mm -hmm. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Mm -hmm. Thou wilt say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? How are you going to answer that, Paul? Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall a thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel under honor, another under dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endureth much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, 
that he might make known the riches of his glory on the mer vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. That's, now that's the inspired commentary yeah. of Israel's oppression in Egypt and deliverance. Yeah. And God says, I did all this. Amen. This is what I did. They say, oh, you see where I'm going here. That I'm saying that he did what we're reading about, too. Amen. Then there's a case of Samson. <coughs> he chose a wife from among the heathen, which contradicted God's own law. Deuteronomy 7, 3 through 4, which had at that time was known. And he contradicted that that law, not to take a wife from the heathen. But God uh, told his parents, God told us, he said, the cause was of the Lord. They did, his parents didn't know it, but it was of the Lord. This whole thing was orchestrated by God, this thing about a Philistine wife, because God sought an occasion against the Philistines. See? God did that. Then there's David. And the numbering of Israel, which we've mentioned several times here. <coughs> One account says God moved David to number it. Another account says David himself did it. Another one says Satan provoked him to do it. God was in all of this. This whole circumstance was worked out by God. It was God working among men. And if God hadn't have told us, you'd have never deduced this. Yeah, that's right. Well, about the salvation of Israel... Salvation of all Israel. Some of the branches of Israel had broken off, but the root was preserved. Some branches from the Gentiles were grafted into the tree to provoke the Jews to jealousy. Then God's going to graft them in again. What kind of wisdom is that? He's still confusing people. But he's done with the Jews. He forgot about the grafting. Yeah, There's right. some grafting going to be done. Amen. God's going to bring him in. First, he provoked the Jews to jealousy by accepting the Gentiles, who are not a people. Now then, he's going to provoke the Jews to jealousy. He's going to provoke the Jews to jealousy by these so that they'll turn to him. Mm -hmm. <coughs> When dealing with sections that accord, record record the experiences of godly men, unless an explanation is provided by the Spirit, I don't see how you've got any alternative but to think that God is working this thing out. I don't see how you could think any other way. If, it was, if, it, if this was a violation of God's law, then the Spirit would have made a comment about it. He did to other people. He did this to other people. So Esau went out to the field to hunt for venison to bring it in. Now here we, you get an idea of what it means that you can't be saved by works. Now people think about this the wrong way. Saved by works. They think you pile up more good works than you do bad works. But that's not how saved by works works. Saved by works mean that something you do gets rid of your sin. That's the issue in salvation. Sin is the issue. you got to get rid of the guilt of sin. And there isn't any work any man can do to get rid of one of the things he did was wrong, which was wrong, let alone all of it. So it's not saved by works doesn't mean you're not saved because you had more good works than bad works. It means none of your works could deal with your sin. Let's just postulate for a moment that you only sin the first 10 years of your life, which is an absurdity, but this is for illustration purposes only. You, you, you quit sinning completely. You reach this point where you reach, didn't sin anymore at all. None of the good things you did could erase those first 10 years. That's what it means you're not saved by works. <laughs> Bring me some venison. <coughs> yes. All our works <coughs> are too small to rid the guilt of the sin. They're they're just too small. They can't cover it. Yeah, and even man knows this. Mm -hmm. 
All for sin could not atone. Even man knows this. See, that's the issue. The issue isn't have you done what have you done enough good. That isn't even the issue. The issue is you've got to get rid of your sin. Yeah. Amen. And only Jesus can get, can get rid of sin. Amen. <laughs> now Rebecca heard this, heard what was said. She'd been waiting 70 years, <laughs> and nothing's happened. 70 years. There's no external indication that Esau and his progeny are going to be ruled by Jacob and his. There's no indication of this at all. She's a hanging on. She's hanging on to this promise. No further word from God. That's the last God spoke on the subject. Just that one time. So if, I mean, if you're a forgetful person, you, you better, you better work on not forgetting. Because if sometimes God just tells you something once, that's it. One time. Repetition is the mother of all learning. See, this is a lot of hogwash. This isn't true at all. This isn't true at all. Now when it comes to kingdom work. So in view of this, she's, she remembers the promise. Nothing's happened. She determines to take some action because she doesn't know either. She doesn't know either when I is going to die. Maybe the next day. She doesn't know. So I've got to do something now because God said nothing. It's got to go through Isaac. I know that. The, the inheritance has got to go through Isaac. Isaac's got to confer the blessing. And he's getting old now and... I don't know when you're going to die. Nothing's happened yet. So I'm going to, maybe this is the way. Maybe this is what I'm supposed to do. Maybe maybe as the, uh, there's an ad of a Christian group that finds your mate. You know, you find a mate. They say, God, you've been waiting on God to do something. Maybe now God's waiting on you to do something. Maybe that's, that's, maybe that's how Rachel thought or Rebecca thought. Time, I'm going to do something now about this. Why? Because she believed the promise. She's motivated by belief of the promise. Admittedly, she didn't understand it. This, admittedly, this isn't what she would have done herself. If she had all the facts in it before, she wouldn't have done it this way. But maybe this is God doing it this way. Yeah. And if it is, Satan is the one that would tempt her by saying this is wrong. See, <laughs> I don't believe we can emphasize too much how blessed we have been to receive such an abundance of revelation. I don't, I don't think we can say too much about this. You see, our Rebecca, she just had one promise. She just had one promise. That's all she had. One promise. Didn't have to do with heaven. She had one promise. Boy, she wouldn't let. She would not let it go. She kept hold of it. We know God works all things after the counsel of his own will. See, she may not have been able to say that like you do, but her, her heart kind of knew this. <clears throat> but motivated by her faith, she, she gives an order, a commandment to Jacob. Now, God worked in this same manner, someone doing something that, looked like it was deceit but God was in fact God told the person to do this this is when Samuel was told to anoint David king <coughs> he'd been lamenting over over Saul's rejection because when he first, when Saul first was a king he was little, little in his own sight and he was a very admirable admirable king and Samuel had been lamenting about it and so the Lord said to him 1 Samuel 16, 1. Samuel, how long wilt thou mourn for Saul? Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Now Samuel is very aware of the wrath and indignation of Saul, so Samuel answers God. 
If Saul hear it, <coughs> how can I how can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. Is that really why he came? God told him he's going to anoint David king. But he said, so far as Saul's concerned, mm -hmm. you're going for to make a sacrifice. Yeah. See now, all right, the legalists might find fault with that, but I'm not going. I'm not going to find fault with it. This is the way God worked. Yeah. You got this is the record. Mm -hmm. God gave a record of this. Take a heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Then call Jesse to the sacrifice. Then I'll show you what thou shalt do. Now I'll, I'll take it from there. I'll tell you what you should do. And it is. He said, what I'm making here is that the poet said God works in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. There's more to that than some people think. Technically, Samuel was not going to offer sacrifice, technically. But this is how God worked it, so there wasn't any unnecessary interruption. So there... Go ahead. Yeah, I was thinking as you were talking about this thing about Rebecca, you know, I think we can conclude... That there's not one word spoken in Scripture against what she did. Oh no! So no. I mean, and there would be if she had done something that yeah. had touched the inheritance, and had done it improperly or wrong or sinful, we would have been told. Yeah. But it wasn't. No it wasn't. one, no prophet, no apostle ever said she shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Yeah, but then I think an important point about that situation with Samuel and Jesse, Jesse and his sons being there, even though he wasn't sent there at all. Make a sacrifice and have a feast. He did do that. Oh, he did yeah. offer a sacrifice. Yeah, there's no yes. Yeah. In that way. That's yeah. Right. But see, Saul. Even if Saul would have had no objection to a sacrifice being offered, mm -hmm. <laughs> none at all. Yeah. <coughs> now. Paul assesses this entire circumstance in Romans 9. He gives, his, he gives an assessment of it, and he makes certain statements about it. Romans, the ninth chapter. He says that a divine determination, Romans 9, he says the divine determination had been made without regard to the works of either Jacob and Esau, neither having done any good or evil. The determination was made before they were born. Mm -hmm. The children not yet born. I'm quoting from Romans 9. Mm -hmm. The determination was revealed to Rebekah prior to the birth of the sons. It was said unto her, the elders will serve the younger. The determination was made in order that the purpose of God might stand. That the purpose of God might stand. Yeah. The purpose of God was made according to election. That the purpose of God according to election might stand. The election of God was not according to works, but of him who calls, not of works. It was not in view of, it was in view of this, these preceded things, that God said the elders will serve the younger. All of this encapsulated, is encapsulated in the saying, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. So what he's saying is this is what I wanted. Whether you can understand it or not mm -hmm. is of little consequence. Yes, God did what he wanted to do, and this is how he carried it out. Yeah. That's what Paul is saying. Mm -hmm. So we're reading about the historical details that fulfill God's revelation, and then the apostles opened it up, yeah. opened it up to us. <laughs> now, the alternative to thinking in this matter is to consider that Rebecca is doing something that was fundamentally wrong, yet which God used to work out his purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you think this is the way God works, so are you for a blessing? In such a case, the purpose of God would be brought to fruition through the blunder of a, of a person. <laughs> <laughs> well, I choose to think that it was God was working the thing out. Amen. He didn't like clean up the mess, so to speak, and do his will. 
which means he caused this to work this way right. so that in the end, nobody could boast. That's right. <coughs> so Rebecca says to her, Jacob, fetch, fetch two kids of the goats. Remember, now he went out to yeah. catch some wild game, remember? Catch, fetch from thence two, catch me two kids of the, oh, excuse me. She says to Jacob, go now to the flock and fetch from thence two kids of the goats. Well, see, Esau didn't go out to hunt goats. Now, it's interesting that the same two, two kids of the goats, the same phraseology is used when providing a sin offering under the law. It says the children of Israel were to take two kids of the goats for a sin offering, just Kind of an interesting thing. But Isaac went out to obtain wild game <coughs> uh, venison. I'll make some savory meat out of these. In other words, she would take these two, these two young kids, young goats, and she would, from them, take meat that would she could make taste like yeah, 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 right. wild game. So those two goats would probably supply what one wild game would supply. Now she appears very aware of the exact kind of food that Isaac enjoyed, which suggests that she probably prepared some of this for him herself and she might be in the Esau's cook too, beside that. However, eating wasn't the primary thing on her mind. She knew Isaac's taking a blessing Esau, and she wants to make it easy yeah. for him to bestow this blessing without some kind of protracted, protracted examination. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So she skillfully prepares a meal she knows he'll like. I won't dwell on this, but there are some men that never get a meal they like. They never had that privilege of having to sit down at a table at something they like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rebecca knew it. That's the way. Yeah. The way you fix something Isaac likes, that he may bless thee before his death. Because he considered Isaac's appraisal of the imminence of his death to be correct. So it must be... Actually, he didn't, he didn't die until 50 years later. He lived 50 years beyond this. <laughs> but he didn't, uh, his sight going away and his strength dissipated, he didn't think he was going to live very long. <coughs> Technically, she was not correct in her thinking in view of what we understand today. But she did the best she could under the circumstances. He confirms the truth of the statement Made in Hebrews, 11th chapter, verse 39 and 40. These all, that's these people living back then, these all obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So if you think her response wasn't perfect, that's why it wasn't. It wasn't because of her character. Or because she lacked commitment. To me, the marvel is how she worked everything out without losing her wits, so to speak. <coughs> now she passes this on to Jacob. Jacob, remember now, people have painted Jacob as a deceiver and a supplanter and a trickster. He objects to this. This doesn't sound like a, like a response of a deceiver. Jacob said to Rebecca. His mother, behold, he saw my brother's a hairy man, I'm a smooth man. My father, peradventure, will fear me, and I shall seem to him to be a deceiver. And I shall bring a curse upon me, and am not a blessing. Now, very that's a very resting consideration. Yeah. But Jacob, I've heard a good part of my life that you were just an old deceiver. That doesn't, that doesn't sound like that the way a deceiver would talk no. at all. My brother, he's a hairy man. 
as in hairy man. When he was born, he had a lot of hair. Hairy man. He came out red all over like a hairy garment. <coughs> they called his name Esau. So Jacob and Esau, they were like different. God's teaching us something here now. They were essentially different. After the fall, Adam and Eve were different. Cain and Abel, they were different. Yeah, brother. I had never thought about this, the difference in how people assess Jacob as compared to how God assessed him. And so you just said it the way you, you did. Yeah. Jacob have I loved. Yeah. But then people are get down on Jacob. Yeah. And in the case of the, of the birthright, he bought it. He bought it. It was a, they, they both agreed. That's right. right. Well, Jacob and Esau them. both agreed mm -hmm. on the transaction. And then the Lord added, thus Esau despised his yeah. right. brother. So it, 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 it was actually a just, mm -hmm. uh, agree, agreed transaction. But just the fact that it's revealed that God loves Jacob yeah. and hated Esau uh, reveals a lot about how men have thought about this. Amen. Mm -hmm. That the purpose of God, in Paul had that the purpose of God according to election might stand. <laughs> he throws that in, yes. Yeah. Esau is actually going to steal the birthright back from his brother by not telling his father that he had yeah. sold it. That's Amen. Right. Yeah. And, and Rebecca, God uses Rebecca to make sure that Esau keeps his deal he made. <laughs> Amen. <coughs> oh, Mother, I know this doesn't sound like a good plan to me. Because, I mean, you know, me and Esau, we're, we're not alike. Yeah. Uh -huh. And my father will tell this me, and then, then he'll think I'm a deceiver. Yeah. He didn't want to be known. This was contrary to his nature. Yeah. Amen. He'll bring a curse on me, not a blessing. In this case, the curse would not be because of disrespect. See, some versions of the scripture suggest that this was a disrespect of Isaac's age, and so he was mocking Isaac. And some versions translate it mock. <coughs> but he feared being identified as a deceiver. He didn't, yeah. didn't want that. But his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice and go and fetch them. Don't we? She's thinking of this promise. See, we don't have time to, to dilly dally here. Yeah. Get to this right away. Thy curse be upon me. Yeah. See, this kind of reasoning is elsewhere in Scripture. When serious, when serious statements were being made, serious oaths were being made and covenants made, <coughs> Joseph told his father Jacob that Benjamin was required <coughs> to, to come back to Egypt. And he sent the word back to Judah. Back through Judah, Judah responded, Send the lad with me. We will rise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou, and also our little ones. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame. So this is a kind of common way serious people talk. Yeah. Abigail and her husband didn't entertain David and his men. David was going to liquidate the situation, and Abigail came to him. She told him he was, a, he was not a good man at all. She fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. Let thine man made, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine enemies. So she laid, she laid her life on the line. And there was that woman from Tekoa. They was going to destroy the city. And the woman from Tekoa come out and pled for mercy. said, My Lord, O King, the iniquity be upon me and on my father's house. See, this is the way serious people yeah. took things. And what about Pilate? And when Pilate said to the people, I don't find any fault in him, they said, His blood be upon us uh -huh. and on our children. And of course, it has been yeah. one of the most dreadful vows of all history. 
So this, however you may view this kind of vow, it confirms that these were matters that they considered to be very serious. I cannot see this kind of vow being made by one who was by nature a deceiver. <laughs> I couldn't see that, <clears throat> whether Jacob or Rebecca. Now, of course, this introduces another thing to us about the Messiah. <coughs> He's in Scripture, if you can see it. Our curse did fall on Jesus. <coughs> he was made a curse for us. Also, we have again, it is the second time in Scripture, the idea of substitution has been brought up. Whatever is due him, doesn't fall on let it fall on me. It's the idea of substitution. Second time it's brought up. See, God's shaping how you think. One person can take the blame for another. That in salvation, that's what actually Jesus did. He took the blame for another. <coughs> Gerald Jacob goes and he fetches. She told him to take two kids from the flock. Which he probably he probably was the keeper of the flock. Picked two young kids. Knows how obedient he was. He went and fetched and brought them to his mother. He went and did it forth with with dispatch. According to nature, age is not generally accompanied by a submissive spirit. <laughs> Jacob had lived forty seven percent of his life at this point. Be like a man about 38 obeying his mother. So we'd say, what is going on there? See, God is in this. Now he raised, Jacob was raised to respect the judgment of his, of his mother. Or as Solomon would say, the law of his mother. Now Rebecca, she's going to prepare the scene. So she puts some goodly raiment, some of Esau's. Sunday go to meet and close. She put she had him in her in her house, which means Esau only wore these things on a, like a special occasion. You see, people people today never do have like a special occasion. They just are always unkempt and sloppy. That's the truth. She took his goodly garments. She, she didn't go get his jeans. Took his goodly garments, very good ones, which she knew Esau would wear for a special occasion. This was a special occasion. The blessing was going to be conferred. I wouldn't want to make an issue out of something like this, but casualness is the rule of the day, rule of our day. It wasn't then. And in the though, Jacob and Esau were probably of similar size. Of course, they didn't wear tight clothing. They were loose clothing, but they were probably of similar size. Now, it's of significance that the words, the younger son, is actually said, the younger son. <laughs> Not my favorite son, the younger son. Because God said the young, the elder shall serve the younger. He didn't say the, the one I hate will serve the one I love. So she, she thinks in terms of what God has revealed. <clears throat> now this is a new covenant manner now. It's a new covenant manner. They actually, we th thinking revolves around the exceeding great and precious promises of God. It's a proper thinking revolves around them. Proper thinking doesn't revolve around the law. It includes the law. It not, doesn't revolve around the law. Peter said that God's glory and virtue has given us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might become partakers of the divine nature. As we participate in God's promises by meditating upon them, thinking upon them, breaking them open in our soul, pondering what God has promised to do, it's like a, a transforming power that Amen. takes place by the Holy Spirit. Solomon hinted at this. He said, as a, man, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. See, he kind of saw the borders of it. And God further told Israel, the way you think 
affects my attitude toward you. Boy, that's a startling revelation, isn't it? Yeah. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. See? That's why he has stood afar off from them. The judgment of against the world of Noah's day was because the thoughts of the imagination of the heart was only evil continually. However, the new covenant makes a fundamental change in the way people think. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Well, they're even more firmly established by belief of the truth. Amen. Thinking is brought to its highest level when it centers in the promises of God. Just as Rebecca's thinking come to its highest level when she's thinking of the promise of God. I'm saying that Rebecca was thinking upon what God had promised regarding her son. Had she received more revelation, she'd have probably gone about this a different way. But it seems to me that God's showing people. <coughs> God's showing people, even though expressions may be imperfect, if they're thinking about what I said and they're doing their best, they're seeking my face, they're doing their best to please me, they are more apt to receive more. Yeah, amen. Because, they, because they have attained that posture. <coughs> Loved Jacob. Yes. And that was after she had received this promise. That's right. That they were still in the womb. Amen. Mm -hmm. So now Re Rebecca prepares Jacob and the meat. She cooks it savory mm -hmm. from goat meat. She prepares something that tasted like wild game. I mean, that's so she must have been an expert mm -hmm. cook. Then she took the skins of those goats. And she put him on the back. See, now remember, he had a robe on, which probably went down to here, when it flowed down. So it was just the back of his neck mm -hmm. and his hands are all a part of his skin that be showing. Yeah. Well, she put that goat's hair on his hands and his neck. Now, the Treasury of Scriptural Knowledge notes this. Travelers inform us that the eastern goats have long, fine, and beautiful hair of the most delicate, silky softness. Indeed, the animals literally in, these, in those hot countries are not covered with so thick a coat of hair as they are in the more northerly regions, so that Isaac might easily be deceived when his eyes were dim and his feeling no less impaired. And one, one resource told us that they actually make human wigs out of uh, this type of goat's hair. So... It, was, it, was, it wasn't like a sheep's wool. It was like a goat's hair, just like a, like a hairy person. <clears throat> it's enough to say here that Rebecca was well aware of what pleased her husband. She anticipated what he'd do. He couldn't see him, so he'd touch him. See, she, she figured all this out ahead of time. I want to draw some conclusions. <coughs> some parallels between Jacob and Jesus. Because Jacob, in this case, is a type of Christ. Both were promised. The elders will serve the younger, and unto you a child is born. See, both were promised, both were younger. Jacob was a second twin. Jesus was a second man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. both, yeah. both were ahead of a people. The elders so served the younger was speaking of their progeny mm -hmm. rather than the progenitor himself. That same with Jesus. Jesus is the head of a people. Yeah, right. His body. They both were promised rule. Mm -hmm. The elders so served the younger. Jesus was exalted and over everything that was come from the first Adam, as well as everything else. They both were loved. Rachel loved Jacob. God called Jesus his beloved son, so yeah. both were loved. They both dwelt in Canaan. 
From a physical viewpoint, Jacob lived in within the borders of Canaan. During Christ's ministry, he lived in the borders of Canaan, and then now he's in heavenly places where the children are. <coughs> and he took the place of an, something else. Jacob took the place of Esau. Jesus took our place. And if I might uh, speak of a bit of holy imagination here, Jesus interceding now. Sounds like the voice of a man. He, the Father addresses us to Jesus. He says, it is a man. He's appearing there for us. See, there's quite a, quite a parallel here. And uh, he, Jacob wore the bow. He wore the best. Jesus wore the best, a robe of righteousness. He appeared before his father in the likeness of another. Jacob did. Jesus appeared in the likeness, appearing in the likeness of humanity. Jacob obtained the blessing. Jesus obtained the blessing. Jacob gained the inheritance. Jesus gained the inheritance. <laughs> See, so there's a kind of an outline of Jesus actually seen in yes. seen in Jacob so it's uh, well it's just good to think about now I'm going to suggest to you that in view of what I just got through the perils I just got through doing saying that God arranged this situation yes. so they would in fact parallel yes. Redemption, that this was an on purpose right. situation so you could see how, what's really happening behind the scenes mm -hmm. is Jesus is appearing before God as the man, Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Not the Adam man, but the man. On earth, he wore a likeness of Adam. But he wasn't Adam, just like Jacob had a likeness of Esau, but he wasn't Esau's hair. He had a, <laughs> see. Well, I think I'll, I'll close there. And if you have something you'd like to add tonight? Yes, Sister Tasha. Yeah, a couple of things. The Lord, the Lord is the author of salvation. And so if, if there's an author that's writing a book, he, he has... He has the privilege of writing the book how he wants it written. And the same thing with the Lord. If he, if he is the author of this salvation, then he has the right or the privilege yeah. to be able to orchestrate things to show forth what is coming in this Amen. salvation. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, too, is that we have a little bit of history of Rebecca. The Lord revealed her character to us in the beginning mm -hmm. when, yeah. she, when she came Isaac, and so for people to um, skew that character and to come up with something different than what the Lord showed yeah. forth her character as is just it's not right and it's wrong. If it doesn't match who she is, then it can't be true. Amen. <coughs> Amen. <coughs> Sister Barb. And thinking about how our generation has been speaking about this situation and our brother in here. I was reminded of Paul and his reasoning about uh, the brother who couldn't eat meat. Yes. And he specifically said, "Howbeit, there is not in every man that knowledge." Knowledge, sure you are. And this is exactly what That's we're dealing right. with here. That's the right. The knowledge of these brethren being immature that it wasn't revealed unto them for the time. So how did Paul go about dealing with this brother who couldn't consciously eat meat unto God? He said, "I won't eat meat." So I don't cause him to offend. He it's was a, merciful and gentle with him. Amen. And this is the same situation we have with our brother in there under the old covenant. Under the old, it wasn't even the law yet. So it was the, the time of dim light that the Lord was able to shine in that time. And so we also want to be gracious. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was um, struck by Jacob's desire here that he did not want to be known amen. as a deceiver. Amen. What has Satan done? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Made him known as a deceiver, yeah. but but 
but that was Jacob's desire that he he wanted to be above reproach. Amen. And this is a, a strong demonstration of faith on Rebecca's um, part. Oh yes. She knew her husband. I mean, she knew her husband, and she, all this, this time they lived together. And like we said, we don't know whether or not she told him uh, what was revealed to her, but I would think probably they had to talk about it. But then. All this time, she waited. Yeah. And at, at this point, whenever she saw that her husband was going to make the decision to bless the one that was not going to be the one that should be blessed, she, uh, according to faith, made a decision That's right. to do something mm -hmm. different. Amen. So, so this was a strong faith, even even to the point where her son said, I don't want to be saw as a yeah. deceiver. She said, let it be upon me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how strong her Amen. faith was. Amen. 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 We uh, we discussed we uh, we left with the same conclusion when we went over Ishmael mm -hmm. and yeah. Hagar. You remember yeah. that uh, they she entered that with the same kind of faith. Mm -hmm. That's like right. Trying to make this the best they, with their understanding. That, you know that right. made a, a clear <laughs> point clear and, and their, their understanding. See, they were gonna they want to do what they could to bring about this problem. As far as they knew, that God had like yeah. uh, told mm -hmm. them. You see how that all illustrates what not saved by works. See, that that nails that down so you know what that means. They had noble they had a noble aspirations. It wasn't that they didn't have noble aspirations, but their works couldn't weren't adequate to reconcile them to God. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this record and for Jacob. We are ashamed that members of our race have criticized Jacob as though he was a rebel. We're thankful that you have were very careful to protect his integrity and character in the record Amen. and that any deficiency he had was owing to the deficiency in his understanding. We want to be among those who see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom, but we do not want to be among those thrust out. We have a, an abiding appreciation for these great men and women of faith who lived before us, who didn't have all the advantages we have, and still they clung to what they did have and lived their lives in view of it. We pray, Lord, that you'd uh, give us grace to follow in their train. In Jesus' name, amen.